Hi, welcome to this mini lecture on design thinking for your toolkit for social innovation. This lecture complements the week's readings with some definitions, examples, and visuals. I want to emphasize familiar process frameworks, the notion of design as mindsets. It's not a specific product nor exclusive to trained and professional designers. While I believe we are all designers in some way, not everyone is comfortable with their design identity or even aware of it while others do this for a living. So however expert we think we are, including me, we can all learn more practical tools, more ways to be insightful and to see possibilities and more practices that can make it more useful and more relevant for different contexts and different people. We also need a common vocabulary to collaborate with other stakeholders, colleagues and communities and the end users that we aim to serve. We are navigating new territory and so I want to put some pins in to highlight some places, some territory. First, design, then process frameworks and mindsets, and some examples linking those to your readings. First, what is design? When you think of design, what comes to mind? Fancy PowerPoint graphic template? The iPhone and all its apps? Interiors in fancy magazines? Well, design is in everything we do and in the systems in which we reside. It's also a way of thinking and doing, and it's not just for paid professionals. So it's in our natures to design, to make new things and find solutions and fix problems and create things. Professional designers and design scholars reflecting on what they do can bring awareness of design as process frameworks and mindsets. So for frameworks, let's start with this well-known model or framework from the Institute of Design at Stanford, the D School. It's a process that starts with empathy for the end users or the audience, so as to learn more about what, what um, the, the context, about who they are and what they need. And then you define the problem. You reframe and rethink the problem into something that fits what you see your audience really needs from what you're noticing. And then ideate, which means just come up with new ideas, often through brainstorming or other ways to spark creativity. Prototype means making something tangible to share, something small, physical, interactive, a representation of a part of your idea, while test means to try it out with others, the actual intended users or those who can role play that part so as you can learn and make things better. So this is human-centered design. It's not technology-centered, that's the main thing. It is empathy for the person in the context you're designing for and getting feedback from your users. So the Stanford D School model has then moved on to attitudes, basically mindsets, but this model has been very popular and well-known, and I think you'll see it around the EDIPT. If interested, check out the D-Schools website. Here are a few more um, frameworks, right, from different schools of thought or different purposes. The Taylor, Taylor Center has developed this iterative model to work with you and with others. It's called Discover, Dream, Do. While IDEO, the big design firm, follows this process called Inspiration, Ideation, Implementation. Also, Hear, Create, Deliver, or HCD. And then one of my favorites is The Innovator's Compass by Ella ben Ur, formerly of IDEO. She aimed to simplify design into just everyday ways to get unstuck, thinking about specific questions around people, what we're noticing, what are some principles, what are some ideas we have, or what are some experiments. These are, and some of other, these are some of the frameworks to keep in mind. On your Canvas site, find one from the Creative Reaction Lab, which brings more critical perspectives on structural racism in the US to bear with the, the D-School framework. Okay, design mindsets. That's another way to think about design. Mindsets that you take on with intention. And this way you don't just replicate a process in a mechanical way, which could then lead to unthoughtful and inappropriate designs, but be paying attention to what you're doing, why, with whom, so design is not just a linear process or a framework with fixed stages. It's a set of mindsets then that anyone can develop. And these are some of the mindsets that you'll see in the examples. Empathy means really thinking about what's going on with the people, putting yourselves in their shoes, the people you want to design for. Those might be the pregnant women you aim to care for or the healthcare system, the professionals that they're engaging with. It might be residents of a neighborhood. So beginner's mind says, ask questions. Ask why, why, why? And don't think, take things for granted. Improvise and build on others is the yes and mindset. Working together with others and building on it rather than being critical or judgmental or shooting it down. 
Bias to action means getting up and acting. Try it out. Less talk, more less discussion, but more prototyping, so as to communicate and test and learn with others. Then working together with diverse other peoples, we, we can generate more ideas and build on our strengths and then co-design for those complex problems and find solutions. While be visual is like these little images helps to communicate beyond words. So using maps that you're learning about, the sketches, 3D mock-ups, and there are others. So that's mindsets and frameworks. And we bring those together and we have divergent convergent thinking as a meta way of thinking about think this is a meta way of thinking about the thinking. Sometimes you will be diverging in thinking about a problem and situation, gathering information, expanding possibilities and directions, and it can seem overwhelming. And then you get information that helps you hone in and converge and focus in on specific people, core needs, solutions, directions, um, budget constrictions, geographic considerations, priorities, other information comes to bear and you converge and then you have a design solution which they then put back out there and things can expand again. So this is a way to think about diverging thinking, big picture, converging thinking and design focus. So you try to be intentional about where you are and bring that to bear on what you're doing. This is hard, it's hard to do. So let's talk about some examples of design thinking in action. We'll start with several to give you some motivation and, and so a range of possibilities from real world commercial to the social sector, from hospital settings to neighborhoods to households, and get some of the why is some of the how. And you'll see mindsets highlighted in some of the examples. While the end users of a design might range from kids in the case of MRI to senior citizens in the case of the design crew to rural women in India seeking water to moms in Oakland dealing with their children and economic insecurity. While the designers range from high paid and experienced professionals to adolescents involved in the process. Okay, one well-known example of design thinking is a strategy for improving on the pediatric MRI experience. And you can find an optional reading on this from designer David Kennedy, formerly of, of IDEO, the global design firm, and he helped start the Stanford Design School. In the story, he, he tells you more, but in some, these MRIs are million dollar machines that offer critical diagnostic information. These are incredibly valuable machines. Yet they are also very noisy and that makes them scary and uncomfortable for, for young children. So many children are need, um, need sedation to tolerate the experience. So at some point, the lead designer of the MRI, a guy working with GE, saw kids crying in the hallway while waiting for their turn to do the MRI. And that really bothered him. It would bother anyone. But he investigated watching how kids play and trying things out and bringing out his observations in the world back into the, um, the diagnostic arena. And to cut things short, he came up with the idea of playful adventures that turned the loud knocking and banging of the MRI into part of a fun experience. And he ended up with nine concepts, submarines, like shown here, or rocket ships going into space, or pirate ships with cannons. And the solutions were not not redesigning or rebuilding the MRI to get rid of the sound, but just running with it. And then it involved colorful theme decals to stick on to the walls and the machine. And the techs were trained and given costumes and a script so that they could then invite the kids into this experience. So patient satisfaction scores went up and sedation was reduced. Interesting, right? Okay, another example is from your readings. This is a classic article from the Stanford Social Innovation Review or SSIR, which is um, coming out of Stanford, um, the social sector. Um, the authors are two highly trained professional designers, Tim Brown and Jocelyn Wyatt. Um, from the global design firm IDEO and its nonprofit arm, IDEO.org. Now, they are large um, organizations with large budgets, IDEO from its professional work and, and sales, and IDEO.org from grants with Gates Foundation and other private foundations like Hewlett, so as to support, and they're making the case to support nonprofit design practices working with global health and development organizations. They're making, they're making the case for bringing hiring designers to support human-centered approaches to these issues of health and water and agriculture and energy and more. 
So design thinking for social impact or for social innovation has become recognized as a field since then. And they give some examples of what they believe is possible. It includes the story of Shanti. It hones in on her specific needs and, and the weight of the water and the distance she's traveling in contrast to the engineering solutions brought by the WASH engineers in this large scale rural Indian program. So these designers are making the case that design can fix issues that standard models to water and sanitation and health challenges can't address because design can see things differently and it can find also more delightful and dignified solutions that really work for the end users and are also sustainable, really or viable in the economic and institutional sense, meaning the solutions will, will continue to persist and offer, offer value. So to me, their approach captures a mainstream approach to design for social innovation involved in main, mainstream organizations and aid and development. And this is similar in, in the United States context as well. Now you might find reason to critique their message from different standpoints, critical of the aid industry in general, and from other perspectives, and I really look forward to talking about that. But this is an important article that establishes a field. Okay, this is exciting to me. One area uh, I support entirely is advancing solar energy systems for rural African and South Asians living off the electrical grid, but needing in electrical power. So they're, they're facing energy poverty. And these are designs for technical systems for rural households with specific little products with the, um, um, the orange boxes with lanterns and buttons and, and um, batteries and the solar, solar photovoltaic. But there are also payment systems that reflect the needs of Kenyan women, for example, the seasonality of income. And then there's the, the innovation of a warranty, which we take for granted, but which is new in this context. And the warranty for advice builds trust with the consumers and encourages them to, to buy and keep those products. And then there's the solar innovation, the, the social innovation of the distribution mechanism, like Solar Sisters and their business package. It creates employment and income for the women who join that scheme, who then take up these other social innovations of the, solar, of the devices and share those through um, neighborhood person-to-person um, -person marketing. So this is a sustainable um, social enterprise model that actually builds on the fact that people are already paying money for things and this gives them something better. And this is a way that multiple um, it shows multiple ways that design thinking has informed these systems from the devices to the business models to the distribution mechanisms to address energy poverty in rural African and Asian communities and economies. So really wonderful work. Now here's a project I've been directly involved in as a lead design trainer and a coach with young New Orleanians such as these in this image here. And they're learning to work in the restaurant and food preparation industry in a social enterprise called Liberty's Kitchen, which was founded sometime after Katrina to help rebuild the city and focusing on youth and sharing useful skills and abilities that they could use in the um, tourism and restaurant industry. So these young people in the picture and a few others, or about 10 of them, learn design thinking hands-on through direct training and practice with each other and with community members. We ran a nine month training and design sprint integrated and you could check out the Vimeo in Canvas to learn more about the design crew. And it was a project with Top Box Foods to bring fresh food to elderly residents of Gust Housing and other neighborhoods to help improve their food system. Now, here are some mindsets at work during this design crew in the sprint. Andrian on the left is mocking up a bulletin board that, and so in a sense, she's rethinking the problem from designing new food products to making information more accessible for elderly residents kind of stuck in their high-rise apartment building, making it more accessible for them. And on the right, Kyle and Liberty tested container sizes with a few others on their team in a hands-on experiment to explore portion size for grab and go for new ideas like hummus. Might not be new to you, but it was new for this context of grab and go and healthy food for, for elderly um, New Orleanians in these housing developments. So you see mindsets of bias to action and Andrea and just trying it out. And this is in the Liberty's Kitchen space. This is what my bulletin board can look at. It could say these things. Empathy, deep, deep empathy that she had based on her experience with working with the people and knowing the neighborhood and thinking about, thinking a little differently about what might be needed. And radical collaboration of the teams actually trying things out together um, 
and bringing their diverse knowledge to it. So mindsets at work. And another one is rapid prototyping. In this case, um, Kristen here on the left was my um, uh, research assistant. She's working with Phil on the right, a member of the crew. And they went next door from Liberty's Kitchen into the Whole Foods supermarket on Broad Street to observe shoppers. So do kind of um, direct observation of shoppers at work and noticing what the shoppers are noticing and paying attention to signage and displays. And then Phil just wrote a sign and took a photo and said, what do you think? Buy this hummus, support youth. And it was checking out what, whether the signage would work and how big the font should be, right? So these are tiny little variables that he could rapidly prototype just by hacking um, in a friendly way the refrigerator boxes at, at Whole Foods. It's not nothing fancy here, but just exploring an, an important variable. Now, an everyday example, because from the readings in these slides, you might get a sense that design thinking takes large foundation grants or teams of cool people and professional design credentials or major universities and in getting involved in some substantial way. And these definitely help, certainly for challenges facing billions of people on an everyday basis, like water and energy poverty throughout the developing world or the global south or even in New Orleans in the US. But these those kinds of things are not essential for bringing design into your life, right? Unlike many technical and scientific bodies of knowledge, designing is something we already do, if not for a paid job. So I think everyone is a designer already, but perhaps you don't see yourself as one. So here's an example. I did this at my home desk facing COVID, um, you know, remote work. Um, I didn't have a very good home office before, so I had to fix it all up and it was just not working. And I needed to, um, I don't know, did I need a new table? People were buying all these expensive tables that rise up and down. Should I buy a riser or a hutch or what? I didn't know. So I used my design skills and I grabbed some three inch styrofoam that was hanging around from a package and a spare wood shelf. And it took five minutes and no money just to raise it. And it fitted all the clutter underneath and it raised the screen a little bit. So I've been having issues with my workstation. Rather than belabor the point or wait for money or get somebody to fix it, I just tried something out. That's called bias to action. And, the, and, and it's also rapid rough prototyping. So bias to action is just getting up to try it. And then the rapid rough prototyping is picking out something to test and just do a quick sketch of it and, and make it real. And then actually since then, I hardly changed it. I just swapped out the styrofoam, which squeaked a lot with some wood, some little chunks of wood and it worked just fine. Didn't need anything more than that. So go ahead, hit pause at this moment, practice bias to action, try something to fix a problem you're facing right now. Maybe the problem is watching a too long video. So pause, get outside, get some fresh air, try that out, and then come back in and resume the lecture. Well, to recap, in this lecture, the aim is to introduce process, process frameworks, particularly some well-known ones that, that you can recognize them and engage in conversations and know this as a vocabulary. I don't mean to say that they're correct or that there's only one, there are many, many, many. And the better you get at it, the more you realize that they all have much in common and that's the spirit of it, is um, to understand the, the intersection. So we have the D-School Empathy Defined Idiot Prototype Test. They added accept to the empathy phase to sort of deal with the facing the reality of the situation. And then later they tossed out all this model and just went to attitudes themselves um, Discover, Dream, Do is one I developed with Jordan Stewart. She developed that for the Liberty's Kitchen Design Crew. It's just more familiar language. Instead of ideate and brainstorm, it was dream, you know? So, so very similar. Discover, Dream, Do is the same process of empathy and define and coming up with ideas and testing it out, but it also is a circle. It's not left to right. One of my favorites is the Innovator's Compass, which I've used for myself. I've used in class for small projects with students. I've used with um, students in Myanmar to explore um, and get to know design thinking. I'm happy to share that example more. And you can visit um, the Innovators Compass website. And these are just different ways to think about design for different people. Everyday Getting Unstuck, um, which Ella Ben Orr developed this for kindergartners and for her own kids for, you know, we're stuck on the breakfast or the morning, let's figure this out. And so anybody can do it, right? So these are really meta tools in your toolkit, ways to guide thinking and action and language and vocabulary to communicate with other people. Another part of the recap, 
that design is really thought of now as mindsets. So don't get stuck in a process framework, although you do need to recognize that. It's really what's going on in our mind. Are we being judgmental and critical or are we being open ended? You know, are, to bring empathy with our people is enhancing on our human centeredness, but in a more focused way. Not empathy is a vague notion, but empathy specifically, wait, wait, what would a middle-aged woman with an infant trying to get to a clinic in Oakland actually experience? What's going to work for her, right? Um, and the human center to reinforce is just meaning not technology centered. So it can, be, it can be misunderstood. So human center means staying attention, paying attention to the people involved in this and rather than being technology centered or even bureaucracy centered, like, like we must follow these rules. So we can try to break the rules or recognize that those are created by people and change those to keep a, a focus on people, but not people in general, specific people, specific people in our system that we care about. You know, and then, you know, return to being four years old, be curious, ask questions, improvise and care and, and, and build on what other ideas people have um, and be playful. So we're going to be practicing these mindsets and then the big meta picture of being open-minded and then being closed in and being open-minded. This is where ambiguity comes in. And divergent thinking means handling the ambiguity and just absorbing more and more possibilities. At some point you say, this is overwhelming. Let's narrow it. What's really at stake here? So we have to have conversations with that. So mindsets. Okay, now to bring all these together, the Best Baby Zone project in Oakland is written up in one of your readings, and there's more information, uh, a project report. PhD researcher and designer Jessica Vechikul led this with a team of UC Berkeley professors, plus government and nonprofit organizations in the Bay Area, in, in Oakland specifically, in California, and this was quite a few years ago now, but they led a, a large team and a design sprint over several weeks, I think it was 12. They deployed all these design mindsets in a, in a focused way. First, the empathy, discovery, beginner's mind, what's really going on, you know, and then collaborating and, and defining the problem. And so what's really interesting here is that they started with the challenge, the systemic challenge of poor maternal health outcomes in a context of chronic poverty and underemployment in the urban Bay Area. And their process of discovery and fieldwork and listening and observing and, and, and transect walks led the team to reframe that public health problem of maternal health into a deeper underlying issue of economic development needs and lack of jobs and need for income. So the team reframed that and then they went further into a narrower design challenge, which you can find in the readings, right? So pay attention to the how and the what that the team did and, and with whom over the specific bounded time frame. So this highlights the power of design to reframe problems that professionals might tend to get stuck on. So to conclude with another simple example of everyday design thinking, specifically rapid prototyping, months ago after I dealt with the, the desk clutter issue, I found myself forgetting my work keys at the times when I had to go back into work and routines had changed and behaviors were affected and this is very disruptive, right? So I dug deeper and then I, and using the iceberg, I noticed some household structures at work and a, um, a bowl had been collecting stuff because we had stopped moving, we changed our routine and this bowl was just a mess of things. And I didn't need to deal with all that bowl. So I just needed something to help me walk out the door with my keys in hand. And so that's what I did. And ended up with um, just one small bowl just for keys. And I have, to, I have to say it worked. I didn't forget my keys and I didn't really need any other solution and that was it. So that's a bias to action. Again, you're about done now, but you could just get up and try something. Okay, that's it. That is design thinking. Every day, paying attention, being curious, trying, learning, not judging or berating people, but gently trying things. And not amazing new devices, but sometimes we need those. It's not waiting for tons of money, but sometimes that's useful. It's not a perfect solution, but moving in the right direction and learning. And it's not expecting those cool professional designers to lead it, though they can be helpful, right? They can bring new perspectives and structures. So I invite you to try it out on your own now, tomorrow, and this week together. And meanwhile, I hope you find the readings useful for the larger context, including water and sanitation in rural India and the particular concerns of women and rural women on foot, right? 
and then MCH and community development in Oakland and about power of problem reframing. I offered examples from New Orleans from the, addressing the food system where young people were learning the skills and, and practicing them. And they themselves were able to see the possibilities to redesign, re reframe and the problem of redesign the solutions. So we will practice bringing tools from designers into our worlds, starting this week with everyday design challenges for each of us before moving on later in the term to addressing a community challenge and thinking about professional contexts for those real large wicked problems. So see you in class. Thanks.